So as a way to close out this Thanksgiving week, today we're looking at Psalm 118. And it's a psalm of thanksgiving, psalm of uh, praise. And I've learned a lot as I've studied, and uh, I'm sure you are gaining some from this as well. Um, these are great psalms. There are actually four psalms that have this language. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. There are four of these psalms. I picked two of them. Maybe next year I'll pick the other two uh, around Thanksgiving time. Uh, but Psalm 118 is the most quoted psalm in all of Scripture, in all of the New Testament. It's quoted more than any other psalm, and I think this morning maybe you'll see why. It's categorized as a Hallel psalm, and simply that just means praise. There are six of these Hallel psalms, and they're all grouped together uh, right here, 113 to 118 uh, in the book of Psalms. And these psalms were used uh, during Jewish holidays and celebrations, including Passover and Hanukkah. Um, they were just psalms of praise and psalms that talk about various things that the Lord had done for the nation of Israel. And so unlike us, the Jews didn't have a Thanksgiving holiday. Um, they weren't cooking turkeys and stuffing turkeys and things like that. Uh, but Thanksgiving was woven all through their culture. In all of the celebrations, there were always often an element of thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. So Thanksgiving was really a part of their culture and way of life. And it was part of their weekly worship as it is uh, for us. I think we all agree that giving thanks is an important aspect of life. That uh, being thankful, having a thankful heart is really a part of being a Christian. It's part of, uh, of life in general, uh, that we would be thankful. So I want to give you the outline of where we're going up front. And again, I'll give you the outline up front if you promise not to go to sleep in the middle. Uh, first, we're going to look at a call to give thanks in verses 1 to 4. Second, a description of deliverance in 5 through 21. And then third, the identity of the deliverer in verses 22 through 29. And Karen uh, read a portion of that this morning. I'm thankful for that. So first, uh, this psalm talks about a call to give thanks and worship the Lord. Within the world of the Old Testament, Israel was surrounded by other nations that had gods that were not good. There were uh, other religions all around them and their gods were not good gods. So for this call to worship, to give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting, would stand out in the culture of the Old Testament. Other religions did not have gods that were good. And so this is unusual uh, for there to be a religion whose God was good, to give praise. This was something that was unique in that time. Uh, child sacrifice and prostitution were common in many of the religions surrounding Israel when they came into the promised land. Uh, and this is really not that far off into history as we think about it. You know, we think about this uh, child sacrifice as part of religion as sort of a barbaric thing. It's really not that far back. Uh, I had the opportunity on a couple of occasions to go to a, a set of pyramids. It's really a, a restored city uh, of ancient uh, people associated with the Aztecs. And uh, this is the Temple of Teotihuacan. Uh, it took me a long time to learn how to say that. Teotihuacan. And there are two pyramids. Uh, this photo is taken from the top of the Pyramid of the Sun. And then off in the distance, kind of on the left of that main street, uh, there is the Pyramid of the Moon. And uh, during two times a year, uh, the sun would be directly overhead in the Pyramid of the Sun, and it would make no shadow at high noon. And then the Pyramid of the, uh, Pyra pyramid of the Moon, uh, several times throughout the year during the night, there would be no shadow cast uh, because of the location where they placed this pyramid. You just think about... <coughs> The culture that came up with this idea, how often they were watching the patterns of the sun and the moon to come up with these locations. 
and place these pyramids there. But you'll notice at the bottom of this particular pyramid, there's a platform with some points coming off of it, that square area in the middle. It was a platform that was raised about this far off the ground, and it had ta uh, tables at the different points of the compass. That platform was there for human sacrifice. Uh, this society was about 200,000 people around the time of Christ. And so not really in terms of the whole of history that far ago, that, that long ago. Um, and you can just imagine what that would have been like for the people to be gathered around uh, during human sacrifice. Their god was the great goddess of Teotihuacan, who was a great spider woman. <laughs> and uh, unless you have visions of Marvel characters uh, and superheroes, uh, I saw a picture of this spider woman, and she's pretty ugly. Uh, very spider-like, very creepy looking. Uh, very demonic in her appearance, but that was the god, and the god needed to be the goddess needed to be appeased, and so quite often they would do these human sacrifices, and uh, you know sacrifice humans to the god, the gods. So to have a religion whose god is good, and we know Christianity to be a religion of a good god who gave himself for us. What a contrast to the religions of the world that require servitude and bondage in so many ways. Uh, we really do serve a good God, and it's something that the psalmist is calling us to tell others about. Tell about the good deeds of the Lord and the good things he has done. So imagine the presence of a good God in a world of gods created in the minds of men. Uh, James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Jeremiah 29.11 also, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So for us, uh, worship of God is not demanded. It's not, uh, you know, required that we, um, you know, serve our God like other religions serve their God. It's not a worship God or else situation. And this is something worthy of telling others about. Our worship and praise of God is due to his great, holy, and good nature. And this is really a reason that you and I can praise the Lord and be thankful. So rightly, the psalmist calls us to give thanks for the Lord to the Lord, for he is good. Now, I want to give you a little news alert here. Uh, within this psalm, you're going to experience sort of a crescendo. There's a building that's happening in this psalm, uh, and you will see where that will arrive at the end. But there are three groups here at the beginning of the psalm that the psalmist calls upon to tell of God's good works. Three groups that uh, come from Psalm 118, 2 through 4. He says, let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. The psalmist is trying to encompass all people. So first he mentions Israel, the nation of Israel, to give Praise for the Lord, for his love endures forever. And then he says the house of Aaron. He's speaking directly to the priesthood here. Let the priesthood uh, say the Lord's uh, love endures forever. And then finally, those who fear the Lord. He's talking to those who are outside of Israel here, who may be God-fearing people of faith. I think it's easy to forget that Israel was to be a light to the nations. It was a term that originated with the prophet Isaiah. The Israelites were to be mentors for spiritual and moral guidance for the entire world. Sometimes I think we forget this. We think that Israel was sort of a nation unto itself and that all outsiders were not welcome in. The truth is that the intention for Israel was to be a light to the nations so that others would know about the character of God because of Israel's relationship with him. 
So the summary of this opening, of these opening lines here uh, in this psalm is that if God has done something good for us, we're called to tell others about it. The goodness of God is to be shared, not kept to ourselves. We are called to tell the world about what God has done through Christ. And it's not a message of terrible, of a terrible evil God. It's a story of a good God who brings good news. So first, the psalmist calls us to give thanks. Secondly, we have a description of his deliverance. The reason for his thanks and praise to the Lord is because of a specific uh, deliverance. And the psalmist gives a little more information about the deliverance uh, that he experienced. We don't know for sure who this uh, psalmist was. We think it was most likely David. Um, and uh, it's, it's probably likely that all four of the psalms which have these opening lines were psalms of David. Uh, there's a passage, we don't have time to go there today, but in Ezra 3, 10, and 11, uh, this psalm was uh, quoted and the credit is given there for David. So our tradition says that this is a Psalm of David, uh, even though it doesn't tell the specifics of what the deliverance was or the occasion, uh, which nations were coming up against Israel. We just know that it was probably David and uh, that he was giving praise to the Lord. There's one little uh, verse, uh, verse 9, I want to mention, because some people say that David wouldn't have written this because of this particular verse in the middle. It says, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And there are some who say that a king would never write something like this. But if you think about David and his humility and his love for the Lord, it would not be out of character for David to say this. So I really do believe this psalm is written by David. Uh, even though we don't know the exact circumstances uh, surrounding this distress that he was under, that the nation was under. So what is, what is the uh, distress? What is the description here of this deliverance? In verse 10, we get a little hint. It says, the king, uh, uh, it says, all nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. So the king was surrounded by other nations other nations that were coming in upon them. He describes it in verse 12 that it was like bees. Verse 12 says, they swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. Uh, the king was pushed to the point of death. In verse 13, it says, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Uh, other versions uh, use wording that's even more dire than than this. And in the middle of all of this, there's a, just an interesting comment, and I really just sort of zoomed in on this as I was reading through Psalm 8, uh, 118. It's an interesting comment by the writer in verse 18. It says, The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. So all through this passage, He's talking about his enemies coming in around him, that he was under distress because of these nations that were surrounding him. And they were like bees, and he's giving a description of enemies coming after him. But then here in verse 18, he says, the Lord chastened me. So who is David's uh, antagonist? Who is the, the person that he's going against here? Is it the Lord or is it these other enemies? And I... I have to say, I think it's a great question for you and I, because sometimes when we feel there are enemies coming in against us, whether it's a person or whether it's physical infirmities or whether it's situations in our family or with friends, we tend to look at the enemies around us, but not see God's hand in it. I think it's a great question to ask sometimes when we're in the middle of distress, is the Lord chastening me is the Lord trying to draw me close to his side often it's in the face of serious injustice or even in the face of death that we're willing to turn back to the Lord and certainly that's the pattern with Israel all through the Old Testament they would wander from the Lord and like sheep he would 
the Lord would go after them and draw them back. That is not just an Old Testament concept. God still, the God that we serve today is the same God in the Old Testament. And I believe he does that with you and I today sometimes, allows circumstances to happen that draw us back to him and get us in line and in obedience of him. Well, we have to ask, what did the psalmist learn from this situation? And what do we learn when we make our way through distresses? What is the psalmist declaring uh, because of what, what he went through? There's three declarations that the psalmist makes in this psalm. Uh, and it's in verses 5 to 9. I, I'm going to read them from my Bible, the New American. Uh, from my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. So first of all, the psalmist declares that the Lord is trustworthy, especially in our distress. God is trustworthy, isn't he? He can be trusted to take care of us, to love us, to guide us through difficult times. Do we learn that God is trustworthy when everything is going well? Or do we better learn that God is trustworthy when we're facing trials? I know my answer. I really am drawn to the Lord when I face difficulties and distresses. It's really when we turn to the Lord uh, most seriously. Then the psalmist says, I cried to the Lord and he answered. I near, need not fear anyone. This is in verses of 5 through 6. And you know, he doesn't really give a lot of specifics about the distress. He doesn't really tell the details of these armies, which nations were coming against him. Only that he cried to the Lord and the Lord delivered him. So it's interesting to me that the psalmist says so much about the Lord's deliverance and his confidence in the Lord and so little about the enemy coming against him. I think that's worthy of note. We don't have the details about what the situation was. We only really have a picture of the end of the story that the Lord delivered him. And I really think it's a picture of our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we tend to mumble and groan when we're under distress, when we're going through a difficult situation. We complain. Sometimes we complain to the Lord. But in the end, the Lord delivers us and he cares for us and he's there all the while through our difficulties. We have kind of a funny thing that happened at our house on Thanksgiving. Uh, we got a turkey. It was the last turkey in the bin when we picked it and it was the largest turkey I've ever seen. It was 22 pounds. Uh, we've only in our house cooked turkeys a few times uh, ourselves. We've always enjoyed going to somebody else's house and eating their turkey. Uh, so we're new at the turkey game relatively, but we had this huge turkey and we looked up, you know, how much temperature, you know, what temperature you're supposed to pull it out and how long it should be in there. And so I was taking measurements and we had a, a marital discussion at our house about how long that turkey should stay in. And I'll just let you know, I was wrong. Uh, I was on the wrong end of that discussion uh, and someone else was right. Um, but the turkey came out, and it was the I, it was the best turkey ever. I mean, it was so tender. The white meat was more tender than the dark meat, and we were so happy. And everybody at the table commented on how wonderful the turkey was. Little did they know about the marital discussion in the kitchen <laughs> room. And that's really the way life is. Uh, we go through a difficulty, or we go through a, a trial, and when we come out, and the Lord has rescued us, the Lord has delivered us. You kind of forget about. The difficulties that you went through you forget about the hard things and that's really an opportunity to praise the Lord and to give him thanks for his dealings with us the psalmist does this over and over again he he identified he wants us to know that it was the Lord who helped him In verse 7 it says the Lord is with me he is my helper I look in triumph 
on my enemies. God's relationship with you and I is personal, isn't it? He's not a distant God doing uh, works in our lives from a distance. He's a God who is up close and personal, and he cares for us. Uh, twice, the psalmist mentions that the Lord is with him. So not only is the Lord the rescuer, the Lord is with us, and the Lord is very personal. Reminds me of Psalm 37, 39. I'm amazed at how many of these uh, sermons draw me back to Psalm 37. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. Maybe you've been learning that in your life in the recent months and years, as I have. Uh, the Lord is the one who rescues his people. If God is our help, if God cares deeply for us, then really, what should we fear? We have nothing to fear if the Lord is on our side. I love Romans 8, 35 through 39. I don't have it on the board because it's kind of a long passage, but it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a great passage to memorize. And I love that it ties in the Old Testament concept of the Lord's help with Israel with the Lord's help of you and I. There's nothing that's going to separate us from God's love and his care for us. So if God is our help, if he cares deeply for us, then we should fear nothing. This uh, uh, idea that the psalmist cried to the Lord and he answered him uh, is a motif. It's a, it's a common phrase throughout Scripture. It appears numerous places. I just picked out three of them. One of them is Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You remember the story from the Old Testament where Elijah was going up against these prophets of Baal and they were going to offer this offering and see which one was consumed by their God and uh, of course, Elijah and our God were victorious. But it's 1 Kings 18, 24. It says, then, this is Elijah talking to the people, then you call on the name of your God, little g, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. And of course, we know that it was God who shone through victorious on that day. Only a true God will answer his followers. The Lord spoke the same thing through uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. Our God is not distant, but he's close. And then remember what Jonah said from the belly of the fish. I think this really ties in so well with our message this morning, Jonah 2, 2. He said, in my distress... Interesting that that word appears there as it does in the Psalms, uh, in our Psalm today. I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. The Lord is the one who hears us when we call out to him. So the first thing that the psalmist uh, wants to declare is that the Lord is trustworthy. Then he wants to declare that the Lord cares. Verses 10 through 14. Psalm 118. 10 through 14 says, All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. So the Lord cares. 
God cares about injustices and he brings victory. Again, another passage, uh, another verse from Psalm 37, 37, 28. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Wrongdoers will be completely destroyed. The offspring of the wicked will perish. I think there's this dynamic that happens anytime we go through a time of trial that involves uh, others, maybe people are saying uh, dishonest things about us or we're facing some difficulty and um, there's this situation that we find ourselves under. But the Lord is faithful. And even though we don't see how he's working things out, even though we may not see the complete of his uh, justice and his victory, we know that in the end the Lord will be victorious. And so there's this tension that we often find ourselves in where we're required to trust the Lord and trust that he's good and that he cares about injustices, that he's working out his will and that it will happen in his time. And really, we face this tension all the time in life. Are we going to trust the Lord? It's really the same, uh, it's the same tension that every Bible hero faced. Will they trust the Lord? When it seems things aren't going their way, it's the same for you and I. Will we trust the Lord in difficult circumstances? There's something really about God's character that draws him to the humble, to the meek, to those who suffer. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Thinking about uh, the message, I meant, mentioned this last week, but Christmas coming up, it's really one of the highlights of Mary's uh, song to the Lord, that she is just so impressed that the Lord would take note of her because she was one so young and humble. But we can take confidence in the idea that God cares about us. He cares about the difficulties that we go through. He cares about our situations. As little or as trite as they may seem, might seem at times, God cares about us. He cares about injustices, and he brings victory. Well, the final one is the Lord is to be praised, uh, verses 15 through 18. The sound of joyful shouting and, and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. The Lord is the one that is to be praised, and the psalmist is making this declaration. The righteous are to give the Lord praise. Verses 19 and 20 says, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. He's, you kind of can see these like bookends in Psalm 118. He starts out saying, you know, praise the Lord for what he has done. And then now at the end, he's kind of winding it down. And we're coming to this crescendo at the end here of the main point that he's bringing us to. And he's just saying, you know, praise the Lord for what he's done uh, because he answers our need. Verse 21, I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. These are reasons to give thanks to the Lord and to praise him. So first, the psalmist gives a call to give thanks. And second, uh, he gives us this description of his deliverance. And third, we have the identity of the deliverer. This is uh, the section that uh, Karen read this morning. And I want to read this again because this is really the pinnacle of the passage. Uh, we're meant to draw our attention to this part of what he's saying. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech thee. O Lord, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, 
and he has given us life. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I give thanks to thee. Thou art my God, I extol thee. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The psalmist declares, this is the day that the Lord has made. You know, when we think of that line, we think of Sunday, we think of singing to the Lord. Uh, but the original context was in the context of the rescue, the deliverance that had come to the king and to the nation of Israel. And there is no question in this passage that uh, the Lord is the one who has done this. It's in verse uh, 23. This is the Lord's doing. The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Notice how the psalmist continues to make this emphasis that it's the Lord that has done this. Well, we have to mention here that often in Scripture, and this is the case here, that there's a dual fulfillment. There's sort of two things that are going on here. On one hand, the psalmist is saying, let's praise the Lord for his deliverance in this circumstance. And there is apparently an identity of someone who came in the name of the Lord that came alongside the king in this deliverance. We don't know who that person is. But the dual fulfillment here is that he's pointing toward the Messiah. This is a messianic psalm, which is one of the reasons why Psalm 118 uh, is quoted so often in the New Testament. There's a dual fulfillment here. There's an interesting passage, a discussion between Jesus and Matthew 21, 42 through 43. I'll read it from my Bible. Uh, Jesus said to them, he's talking to the religious leaders. Uh, these were teachers of the law and scribes and Pharisees, a group of people that he was talking with over several days. He has this interaction with them. And Jesus says to them, Do you, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. Um, interesting culmination to this several day long conversation between Jesus and the, the temple leaders. And here he is taking this psalm and applying it to himself and saying, I'm the one uh, who that psalm is referring to. And Jesus was making that declaration to those leaders. Well, Psalm 118 predicted when the Messiah came on the scene, he would be rejected by Israel's leader. It was all predicted in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before and we aren't really given the full identity of this deliverer in the particular situation of Psalm 118. And it wasn't until Christ came on the scene and began to uh, identify himself. And as people around him were saying, look at how this person fulfills much of what we are reading or what we have read in the Old Testament. The full identity of the one who comes in the name of the Lord began to become clear in the time that Christ was here on earth. And so the psalmist is calling the people to give praise to God for deliverance, but there's this forward look to the Messiah, a mystery. And surely, as the Jews would go into the temple and they would be singing this song of praise, they would know that, yes, there was a specific circumstance that they were singing about, but there were also unfulfilled parts that they were singing that they must have wondered about and thought about. And so imagine being a Jew on the scene the day of the uh, Palm Sunday when Jesus came riding in and as people were putting together that this person is really the Messiah. Imagine what that must have been like to come to an aha moment and say, that's the person who we've been singing about in the synagogue. It must have been an amazing thing as the scales were falling from people's eyes and they could declare blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord to Jesus knowing that he was the Messiah well the Lord was the rescuer many times for Israel 
And that's not only something that he does. It's not only his character in the Old Testament. That's God's character for you and I. We, too, are on the rescuing end of the Lord's love at times. And as you think back on your life, maybe you identify times where the Lord rescued you in your distress. Maybe those times are not really all that distant. Maybe you recognize recent events where the Lord is in the process of showing you love and care and rescuing you in your distress. I really think that the summary of this passage is that when the Lord delivers us, when the Lord rescues us, when we see his hand working in our lives, the appropriate response is to give him praise. And not just say, oh, praise you, Lord, for, you know, just general things, but to name the specific things that the Lord is doing, to call out to him and thank him for the way that he uh, is rescuing us in specific situations. 